Okay, let's let's get started right away. And I'm gonna make this interactive, so it's going to involve you. So you're not just gonna sit there passively, but I'm gonna I'm gonna put you to work in just a minute. I'm, I'm starting this song as a picture that is very dear to my heart. First of all, it was taken by <clears throat> an uncle of mine who used to live in Vienna. He passed away two years ago. Um, but the reason I, I took that picture, I may have to go back one screen so it goes away, is because it actually shows a page from, the, from Newton's manuscript for optics, his book on optics. And it's open on the page where Newton describes the process of refraction, the bending of light <clears throat> as you go from one material to another. In fact, the prism that Newton used to measure refraction is lying on, the, on top of that page. Now, interestingly, Newton never defined the index of refraction, which is the topic of my, uh, of my talk. He talked about refraction simply by listing in a table, which you can see in the background, the angle of incidence and the angle of refraction. He never got the idea of taking the sign of the two angles and dividing them and defining the index of refraction. This manuscript was written in 1706, so about 300 years ago, and it took a full 100 years for, uh, for this man here, um, Thomas Young, to introduce the index of refraction, which you've learned about as you know, this symbol N, which is the subject of, uh, of today's lecture. And I find that there are a lot of lingering misconceptions about the index of refraction and about propagating light. So I'm gonna give you a sort of fun little review, interactive review of, um, of this very fundamental principle. So 1706, Newton introduces the concept of the bending of light and, and describes it in his book on optics. Thomas Young introduces the index of refraction in uh, around 1806. 1906 was Einstein with the, uh, with the special relativity. And shortly after special relativity, there was a lot of discussion among in the physics community about the propagation of light. You may have heard of group velocity and phase velocity. We'll talk about those concepts in just a second. And it was a lot of, um, a, a lot of discussion about what it meant to have a phase velocity that was larger than the speed of light in vacuum. After all, Einstein said that you could not have the propagation of signal, of any signal faster than the speed of light. So there was a long discussion and, and one of the, the people to actually resolve that, um, that sort of paradox, if you want, namely that the phase speed can be infinite and the signal propagation can never be infinite according to special relativity theory. That was actually um, resolved by a graduate student by the name of Briouin, the man who, who discussed Briouin's scattering. And uh, he wrote a few really nice papers in around 19, I think 16 or so. And then later in his life, 50 years later, he was sort of very annoyed. People had completely forgotten about his earlier work. He wrote a book that is really highly recommended to anybody who's interested in wave propagation. It's called something like on wave propagation. I'm not sure you can Google it and you find the entire PDF of the book. I'm not sure it's legal, but, but it's out there. <laughs> published by Wiley. Uh, it's a beautiful little book. That, that sort of resolves this whole idea of, you know, how can you have a very large phase velocity and not have, uh, uh, not have, uh, not violate special relativity. And here we are 50 years after that. And you, I still find that around the world, there are many people who are talking about things like superluminal signal propagation and so on. It's, uh, so I'm trying to resolve that. Uh, that uh, whole conflict. So we're going to be spending quite a bit of time talking about the index. What is that? What does it represent? What determines the index? Then I'll, talk, I'll, I'll show you what happens when the index of refraction goes to zero. 
And, um, you know, natural materials don't have an index of refraction of zero, but we can fabricate materials that have an index of refraction of zero. So I show you some of our work right now where we actually fabricate artificial materials that have very unusual properties. I could give a whole course about it. Unfortunately, I only have one hour, so I'll only be able to give one example. So that's the program. I hope you're ready to roll up your sleeves and dive in. Okay, so very quick review. What determines the propagation of waves? Well, the Maxwell equations determine the propagation of waves, and from the Maxwell equations, you've probably seen, I should have validated that, I'm not sure, but you've seen the wave equations, here it is in differential form, that, that governs the propagation of electromagnetic uh, waves. And if you substitute into that wave equation, a sinusoidally varying function for the electric field, you get a relationship called the dispersion relation between the frequency omega and the wave vector k, which is related to the uh, wavelengths of the light, and the relationship between frequency and wavelength, the frequency and wave vector, is given by the speed of light c in vacuum and a prefactor which contains two material properties, epsilon, the dielectric constant, and mu, the magnetic permeability. And that square root of epsilon and mu is defined as the index of refraction n. n tends to be typically larger than one, which means that the speed of light in a material is not the speed of light c in vacuum, but it's uh, c divided by n, which means it's smaller than c. What that means exactly, we'll, we'll discuss in just a second. Let's first focus a little bit on this quantity n, which is the square root of epsilon, the electric, uh, uh, the dielectric constant, and mu, the magnetic permeability. <clears throat> now, in dispersive media, the reason you see rainbows and the, the reason you see light dispersed by a prism is that N is not independent of frequency. It depends on the frequency. So the N varies as you go, let's say, from blue to red, which is why you can separate those, um, those uh, different colors by refraction. Now, why is that? In order to understand that, we need to look at what makes up n, namely epsilon and mu. So let's look at epsilon first. What is epsilon? Because the frequency dependence of n is determined by the frequency dependence of epsilon and the frequency dependence of mu. Well, epsilon and mu, you may recall, is determined by the response of a material to an external field electric field in the case of epsilon, magnetic field in the case of mu. Let me specify. Let's first look just at epsilon. We ignore mu. So if you take a material, polymer, glass, water, whatever, some material, doesn't even have to be transparent, and you put it between two electric plates, and you apply a positive charge to the top plate and a negative charge to the bottom plate, you create an electric field, and the the field polarizes the atoms in the dielectric. The plus particles are going to be attracted to the negative plate. Sorry, I had said the positive charge on the top, the positive charges on the bottom. So the positive charges are going to be attracted to the negatively charged plate, and the, the nucleus of the atom, if you want, is displaced a little bit in the upward direction, and the electron cloud is pulled down in the opposite direction. That creates an electric field, an induced electric field, that attenuates the external electric field. The degree to which these charges are separated in the dielectric is given by this parameter epsilon. So epsilon, if you want, tells you how much materials get polarized in the presence of an external field. Or if you want to see it differently, you could see at epsilon, epsilon as a measure of how much the electric field gets attenuated. So how does that depend on frequency? Well, it's determined by the different 
charged particles that make up a material. So in general, we can distinguish between three different types of electric charges in any material. The valence electrons, the outer electrons, um, and the ionic cores, which are all the other electrons and the ions. Why do I separate the valence electrons from all the other electrons? Because the inner electrons really only interact with very high frequency and high energy light, like gamma rays or X-rays. And we're not going to be in that regime. We're going to be in the visible regime. And in the visible regime, the only electrons that can respond to the frequencies of visible light are the valence electrons. So for all practical purposes, we can, we can consider the valence electrons separately from the ionic cores, which are the nucleus, plus all the inner shell electrons in the atoms. And then in conducting materials, although I'm going to mostly talk about dielectric materials, but in conducting materials, you have a third type of electric charge, which are the free electrons, say in a metal or an ionic solution. Now, if you plot a dielectric function as a function of frequency over a very, very, oh no, wait one second. Let's first look at one single bound electron. Right? So, so a valence electron, which is bound to an atom, you can approximate the response of that electron to an external field by a particle on a spring, a charged particle that's held by a binding force, the electric Coulomb force, the rest of the atom. And if you look at the response at the dielectric function as a function of incident frequency, you see the behavior that is shown there on the screen called the Lorentz oscillator model. At very, very low frequency here, the electron actually follows the external driving force. So if there's an electric field in this direction, the electron being negatively charged moves in the opposite direction, attenuating the field. If it attenuates the field, epsilon is large. At very, very, very high frequency, the electron can no longer fall, follow the driving force. It's like taking a swing and shaking it so hard that the amplitude becomes very, very small. Right? If you take a swing and you push it slowly, you can get a large amplitude. At the resonance frequency, you can get the largest amplitude. But then if the frequency is really, really high, you're not going to get any amplitude into it. So if the electron doesn't move very much, then the electric field doesn't get attenuated and it's one. So at high frequency above the resonance, epsilon is one. Below the resonance, it has a certain value that's dictated by the binding of the electron. And in between you have what is called a dispersive wiggle. Uh, I won't have time to really go into it. It has to do with the phase difference between the oscillation of the electron and the driving electric field. This is the real part of epsilon, and the double prime here is the imaginary part. Why is the imaginary part the largest right at the resonance? Well, that's when the amplitude is largest. So there's the most amount of dispersion of, uh, of uh, dissipation, sorry, of uh, energy. Now, that's for a single electron with a single resonance. In a real material, there are many differently situated electrons, and they all have different resonance frequencies, depending on where they're situated in the material and what the atom is to which they're bound. And if you look for a material over a very, very broad frequency range, what the dielectric constant look like, it's roughly this type of behavior. Plateaus that go down with resonances in different parts of the electromagnetic spectrum. And look, I plot from X-rays here all the way to microwaves and radio waves on the far right. So let's see if we understand this. At very, very, very high frequency in the X-ray regime or even gamma rays, any material is transparent. Essentially, none of the electrons can keep up with the high frequency vibration. We're above the resonance frequencies of all. So that's why at really, really high frequency, you have this value one. As we lower the frequency, the valence electrons will start responding. So you have one of these jumps up, there's one of these dispersive wiggles, and you end up with a higher frequency where all of the valence electrons now all of a sudden can keep up 
with the external field. And then for even lower frequency, the ionic cores, which are much heavier and much more sluggish, also start moving because they can keep up with the external driving field. They attenuate the electric field and the, uh, the, the dielectric constant is even larger. And at even lower frequencies, if you have dipolar molecules that can orient themselves in a, in a liquid, let's say, you can get really high values of the dielectric constant up to a thousand or, 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 or even more. Now, of course, in reality, it's more complicated than this. There are many more resonances, so it's, it's not as clean as I show it here. But typically, over really large frequencies, you see this step-like behavior. Normally, we don't look at this large spectrum. Normally, we only plot over a tiny little bit, and we look at the little part. Now, you probably learned in your course here that typically the index of refraction, and therefore epsilon, tends to go up as the frequency goes up. I'm sure you've thought about that, right? Yes. <laughs> the index of refraction goes up as the frequency goes up. What am I showing here? It's going down as a function of frequency. Were you taught something that was incorrect? Or are both correct? How can we resolve that problem? Anybody have any idea? Don't be, don't be, don't be shy or ashamed. I was stumped by it myself. When I first saw this plot, I thought, how does this connect to what I've learned that the index of refraction goes up? It goes down. Yes. Go ahead. Mu, mu, mu essentially is one, as we will see in just a second, especially in the optical regime. So, so in this regime, you know, mu is one, so we can ignore a mu. But very good point that you think of mu. But in this regime here, as we will see, mu is essentially one. So why is it that you are typically taught that the index of refraction goes up with frequency, and here we see epsilon going down? The answer is on the screen. You just have to look carefully. Yes. So I, I, I think you say the right thing. I can't hear you very well. But typically, we only look at the small range. Let's say we look at a small range here. Notice that it does go up because of these dispersive wiggles. It goes down whenever you have a resonance. Then it goes down. You get something called anomalous dispersion. You may have heard of the term before, but everywhere else it goes up. It goes up here, and then you go through a resonance, it goes down a step, but then it starts going up again. And then when you enter a resonance, again, boom, it goes down and it goes up again after that. So over limited regions, it goes up. It's only during resonances that it tumbles down. And there are these steps where it stumbles down. So, so, so both are true. Over a broad range, it goes down. Over a smaller range, it, in a non-anomalous part of the spectrum, it tends to go up. So what you learned is completely correct. And what I told you is also correct. So let's now look at mu, since you brought up mu. There are also magnetic resonances. But magnetic resonances are a little bit different, right? You have electronic. Resonance, the spin of electronic particles like the electron. You have the nuclear spin that responds to external magnetic field. And then you have domains of materials that respond to external magnetic field. And each of those have similar type of resonances. And if you plot mu over a large, it's a little bit more complicated because of ferromagnetism and, and, and so on, but, but we're going to shove all of that under the rug. But if you plot mu as a function of time, it also shows plateaus if you want, like that. But there's one huge difference. Then we look at the frequency regime and look at what it says here. The magnetic resonances are much more sluggish 
than the electronic resonances. And therefore, by the time you get into the microwave regime, mu is one. So anything above the micro regime, microwave regime, the index of refraction is completely determined by the dielectric uh, constant. Okay, it's about six orders of magnitude lower here. The, the, this last dispersive wiggle in the dielectric uh, fraction takes place at about 10 to the 16 radians per second. And here we are at 10 to the 10th. So in the optical regime, and photonics typically tends to deal with the optical regime, mu is approximately one. Okay, so now we know the index of refraction is the square root of epsilon times mu, and in the optical regime, it's essentially the square root of epsilon. Now, both epsilon and mu are complex quantities, and the real part can be negative under certain circumstances. For example, you know, some of these resonance can be, the resonances can be so strong that actually the value becomes negative. What does it mean to have a negative um, real part of epsilon and or, or a real part of mu? What happens? Because now you get a negative value under the square root. What is that going to do to n? So let me answer that question, or at least start answering. It's going to take me about 15 minutes to answer that question. And I've seen so many misconceptions about this, even with people who are active researchers in the field of photonics. So I think it's important to discuss this in a, in a, in a clear way. So let's write down epsilon and mu as complex quantities. So I write epsilon as an absolute value of epsilon, which is the amplitude, times a phasor with a phase angle theta, e to the i theta. And I do the same thing for mu. Mu is the magnitude of mu, the amplitude, times e to the i times a phase angle phi. And if theta and phi would be zero, then epsilon and mu would be real and have no imaginary part. So I'm going to plot them on a unit circle. I'm going to pretend that epsilon absolute value and mu absolute value are both one. Of course, they're not one, but I'm going to just pretend they're one. So let's say mu has that value, which means it has this real value here on this axis, and this projection is the imaginary part. And likewise, epsilon has nearly its maximum value and has a small negative imaginary part. Let's say that, that those are the values for epsilon and mu of a given material at a given frequency. What is n? Well, n is the square root of the product. So it's the square root of the product of the amplitudes, this factor here, and it's the square root of the product of these two exponentials which becomes e to the i theta plus phi divided by two. So where does that lie? e to the i theta plus phi divided by two. Well, this is phi, this angle. This angle is theta. So I sum the two angles divided by two. So n is on the line that bisects the value for mu and the value for n. You should pay attention because I'm going to ask you a question in just a second. So my question to you is, is that the only possible value, the one that I'm showing there? Or is there one more value that I overlooked? Or are there many more? Or is the answer, it depends. So here's what I want you to do. I want you to think about it without talking to your neighbor. I'm gonna give you one minute to think about it. And then we're gonna vote. All right, so who wants more time to think? Just wave at me like this. If you, if you don't stop me, then I'm gonna ask you to vote and everybody will have to vote. I'll say how. If you do not vote, I'm gonna to come to you with this microphone. <laughs> I'm gonna put it right in your face. And you're going to have to tell everybody what you think, okay? 
We're going to vote as follows. I'm going to count to three. One, two, three. And at the count of three, you all have to put your hand on your chest, indicating your choice with the number of fingers. No talking to each other yet. So one is one finger, two is two fingers. Need more time to think? Nobody needs more time to think. Good for you. At the count of three. One, everybody, okay? One, two, three. Okay, I see threes, I see fours, I see twos, I see ones, you see everything. Obviously not everybody can be right. So what I want you to do next is find somebody next to you who has a different answer and then try to convince that person that you're right. Go ahead. <laughs> count of three. One, two, and three. I see ones, I see twos, I see threes. I don't see fours and there are no fives, so that's, that's okay, that's great. Okay, so we haven't reached agreement here. Let's think about this for a moment, and it's actually kind of tricky. There is another route, right? Remember what I did was I did e to the i theta plus phi and then divided by two to get the angle. But as you know, you can always add two pi to an exponential, right? You just go one more time around. So let's just add two pi to the e to the i theta plus phi. Now, if I take the square root of that, what do I get? I get the angle e to the i theta plus phi over two plus pi. Where is that? That's on the other side of the circle. Now, before you get too excited, <laughs> Before you get too excited, let's think about this for a moment. What does N determine? N determines the relationship between the wavelengths in vacuum and the wave vector K. So N is a complex quantity, right? It has a, it has a real part and it has an imaginary part. So, so the real part is this negative part here in this case. And the imaginary part is this negative part. So I have to write this as a real part and a negative part. And the real part of N gives me the real part of K and the imaginary part of N gives me the imaginary part of K. Where does K appear? K appears in the expression for the oscillating wave, E to the I K X plus omega T. So let's put K prime plus I K double prime in here. That gives me e to the minus imaginary part of k times x in front of a sinusoidal function. This is a real thing. Now, what happens when k prime is negative? What does this term normally indicate, e to the minus k double prime x? What does it represent physically? You have a sinusoidal wave. And as we propagate along the x, what happens? What happens as we propagate along the x? x becomes bigger. Minus kx e to the minus kx becomes smaller. So what is that called? The wave? What does it do? 
It attenuates, exactly. I heard somebody say the right word. It attenuates. As we know, if you propagate a waste through a medium, it attenuates because of you know, absorption, dispersion, and so on. Now imagine that K double prime is negative. What would this mean? As the waves propagate, it doesn't attenuate, but it, it what? It gets stronger, yes. That'd be cool, right? Have light that gets stronger. Can that happen? I see some people say yes, other people say no. So can it happen or can it not happen? It cannot happen in an ordinary material, right? I can I can turn on my I can turn on my my light here, my phone, and it attenuates as it propagates in addition to, to radiating outwards, but even in a linear propagation, it attenuates. However, in a laser, light is amplified by stimulated emission. So in an active medium, it can amplify, but in a passive medium, it has to always attenuate. So in a passive medium, you only have one route. So um, yes, this is the only possible value for a passive material. But of course, I didn't tell you that. So, you know, no, there's once more is correct too, because for an active material, there might be another root. And in fact, if you're like a lawyer and you say two pi is the same thing as four pi is the same thing as six pi, then the answer three is also correct. And four is also correct because it depends on whether you're an active or a wrong material. So you were all correct. <laughs> <laughs> now be careful, I will not be as generous with my next question, okay? <laughs> okay, so the, this little exercise, what it showed is how to find N for a passive material. Just draw the line that bisects epsilon and mu, and then take the upper branch. And that gives you N for a given epsilon and a given mu. Remember, that was not the answer that we were looking for. We were looking for what happens when the real part of epsilon and or the real part of mu is negative. Well, let's look at it. Here, you can see that we have a negative epsilon, real part, right? This is the real part of epsilon and it's negative. And this here is the real part of mu and it's negative. And what does that give us for N? It gives us a negative N, a negative index of refraction. So here's my next question. Must both the real part of epsilon and the real part of mu be negative in order to get a real negative value of n? Yes or no? No talking to your neighbor yet. Who wants more time to think? Just, just do like this, very discreetly, so that only I see it. No way, everybody ready to vote? Okay, at the count of three. One, two, and three. I have a poll here. Okay, so let's look. Twos and a few ones. Okay, so we see a, I see an overwhelming majority for two, which is the correct answer. Congratulations. I will not ask you to talk to each other because most of you had the right answer. Look at that. Now that I say that two is the right answer, many people online are shifting their, their answers. <laughs> okay, so let me show you why. Here, look at this. If I put mu there, right, mu here, in the, in the, was a positive real part, and epsilon was a negative real part, I can still get n in the negative uh, half plane, right? So I don't need both to be negative. But, and this is what I wanted to point out, you need a magnetic response because remember, mu is one, right? For in the optical regime for most material because the resonances are in the microwave regime, they're not in the visible regime. So mu is stuck here. And if mu is stuck there, and if mu is stuck there, then n, you know, epsilon can go all the way here, then n is essentially stuck on the right side of the axis. 
So in order to get a negative index of refraction, you would need a magnetic response. What would happen if the index of refraction were negative? Well, let's look at that expression again that I had up a moment ago relating k and lambda. Right, we were looking at the imaginary part before. Now let's look at the real part. What happens when the real part is, um, is negative? If the real part is negative, then the propagation velocity of this wave is reversed. This is what would happen. You can see here a wave arrive. The red and the blue are the, fake, the, the waveforms of the light. And when they arrive at the material is negative and expected, they jump to the other end, travel in the opposite direction, and then back out. Red follow red from the left. I don't know why it's so small, it should be bigger. But anyway, let's follow a, a blue one here now. It, when it arrives at the material with a negative index, it jumps, travels this way, and then goes to the exit end and goes out. How can that be? Can the wave really jump from one end of the material to the other? And in particular, does that mean that we have some kind of a superluminal transmission of signal from, from one end to the other? What about causality and special relativity? Now, first of all, the pointing vector always points in the same direction, namely towards the right in the case that I had illustrated because the direction of the electric field and the magnetic field doesn't change and therefore the right hand rule still gives us the same direction. What changes is the k vector which goes in the opposite direction. Not something that we can easily imagine. So what about causality? And this is where Greenwine's work of about 100 years ago is actually very insightful and he gives a beautiful conceptual explanation of this. You see, when this wave arrives here, what I showed was a steady state situation, but what we really need to look at is what happens if you suddenly turn on a wave that moves towards the material. The, the, the wave arrives here, and what you see inside the material is a superposition of two waves, the external wave, plus the response of the material to the external wave. So if the wave, if we look at a, at, a, at a wave that arrives like this in the material, the atoms here cannot respond to anything before the wave is there. So it's impossible for the wave to jump from one end to the other. What you see in the previous movie is simply a superposition of the incident wave plus the response of the atoms. And we know from watching Wild West Western movies that we can see strange things happen when you superimpose two things at different frequencies. Think of the wheels of the wagon in a movie. Sometimes you see them spin backwards, even though the wagon moves forward because there's a beating that occurs between the frequency of the movie and the rotational frequency of the wheels. So in order to see what really happens, we need to take a wave that gets suddenly turned on and let me show you a simulation of what that would look like. Here the waves arise, and notice that in the beginning, there's just some response in the beginning, and it takes a while before you see the propagation in the opposite direction. Now you start seeing it, right? As the wave and the response of the material is well established. It's not that it jumps from one end to the other and then, uh, and then uh, back. There is no superluminal propagation. In fact, if we take this movie and we show each frame in one row, one pixel, so each of these is, is one frame and time is on the vertical axis. So this is the first frame, the second frame, the third frame and so on. Here is vacuum, here's the material, here's vacuum. You see this, you can see the material coming in at the speed of light in vacuum. And you can see that the reverse phase propagation takes a while to establish itself. You can really only see here that this is slanted in the other direction. Here is kind of a mess, what is happening right there. You can even see the group velocity, the velocity at which the energy of the wave travels into the material. And you can see that that group velocity is smaller than the speed of light C. Yes, it's steeper, 
but don't forget we have time on the vertical axis and distance on the horizontal axis. And then here you see the speed of light in vacuum again. But look carefully here below that dotted line. You can see that there is something there. I'm going to change the contrast so you can see it better. You can see sort of high frequency uh, light coming out. That makes sense, right? Because high frequency means lower index. That means the higher frequencies come out first. The blue light makes it through the material the quickest because from blue light, the index is approximately one. It's not lower than, than anything else. In fact, you see something absolutely remarkable. Brillouin does not point this out in this. Uh, well, he does somehow point it out, but not as clearly because he couldn't do these numerical simulations that I'm doing here. But you can see very clearly, not only the high frequency, Precursors, but you can see that the signal always travels at the speed of light C. Do you see that? The front there is always just a straight line. In fact, look very carefully at this animation again. Follow the red here. It goes, and notice that that front, it just moves through the material as if there is no material. The speed of signal transmission is always C in any material. It's not lower, it's not higher. It's not affected by the lens of refraction. It's C. Beautiful how that, how that works. Couldn't resist pointing it out to you. So let's quickly look at the classification of material. So we're going to put real part of mu on the vertical and the real part of epsilon on the horizontal, rather than real and imaginary part on the two different axes. So in the first quadrant, we have dielectrics. Dielectrics have a positive real mu and a positive real epsilon. And we get the ordinary propagation of waves. On the second quadrant, real mu and negative real epsilon, we have metals. And therefore, we have no propagation of light. You can't propagate light through a metal. You get sort of an attenuation at the, at the, at the edge. You get an electric plasma that reflects the light back. If you were to have both, negative mu and negative epsilon real, you get something called a negative index material. And then if you, in the, in the fourth quadrant, pardon me, in the fourth quadrant, you get sort of the magnetic equivalent of a metal, but they don't occur in the optical regime. But the problem is that with all materials, we're stuck on this line in the optical regime because mu is equal to one. So silver, gold, they're here. Here's air, here's glass, here's silicon. Air is very close to vacuum, one and one. Glass, silicon, and so on. So we're stuck on that line. We cannot get to negative index material, but we can get to zero materials because what if we let epsilon go to zero? We're on this axis. Well, if epsilon is zero, then n is equal to zero. What would that mean? Which of the following is true if we have a material where n is equal to zero? Does the frequency go to zero? Does the phase velocity become infinite? Both of the above? None of the above? Ready to pick your answer or wave like this when you want some more time? Okay, I see some people want some more time to think. Good for you. Thinking, that's what it's all about. That's what is the beauty of physics. I see some people are eager to talk already. Very good. Are you ready to go? Make a choice. And at the count of three, one, two, and three. Okay, ones, fours, twos, and threes. Hmm. I have to have you talk to each other for a few minutes. It's too big a spread in answers. So go ahead, see if you can uh, convince each other. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. 
the frequency. Say you have a swing, right? And you're pushing the swing. Who determines the frequency at which the swing, you hold the swing and you shake it back and forth? What determines the frequency? Or who determines the frequency? You do. You're the, the one who are setting the frequency. Likewise, with an electromagnetic wave, it's whatever you know, created that electromagnetic wave <clears throat> that determines the frequency. So the frequency cannot change from one medium to another. And therefore, we can eliminate two, which means we can also eliminate three. So that leaves only one. Oh, sorry, we eliminate one, and we can eliminate three. So that leaves only two and four, which is pretty much what <clears throat> you had. So let's look at the wave equation again. I had this slide up earlier. What happens when epsilon goes to zero? It's really remarkable what happens when epsilon goes to zero because this term drops out. The wave equation, the beautiful wave equation of electromagnetic uh, becomes another type of equation. What kind of equation is that? Um, Laplace equation, exactly. And where does the Laplace equation appear in electromagnetics? It's very weird. It appears in electrostatics. The Laplace equation gives the solution for electric field in electrostatics. Statics means not changing. Why right? do you get a uniform field? Now, of course, it's a very weird uniform field in the case of a zero index material because your uniform field is oscillating back and forth at terahertz frequency. So it's certainly not statics. But you can apply the solutions for electrostatics to oscillating electric fields. And this just loses its spatial dependence, right? If, K go, if n goes to zero, k goes to zero. If k goes to zero, you just have e to d minus i omega t with a constant amplitude e. It's a uniform field. And what does that mean about omega over k, which is the phase velocity? One over n becomes one over zero, which is infinite. So the phase velocity becomes infinite. But the frequency cannot change. So number two, good for you, was correct. So if n is larger than one, the phase, the, the, the phase fronts get crunched. If n is between zero and one, they get stretched. And at zero, it's just uniform. And, uh, and at negative, it will be this weird thing of the wave fronts moving in the opposite direction. So this is what a zero index material would look like. You have this uniform phase inside uh, the material. So what can we do with uniform phase? Well, imagine we have a fiber where part of it is zero index. We send in a wave inside that gray area, which is zero index, the phase is completely uniform. We can put something in there. It would not disturb the propagation of light because the phase all around it is uniform. 
perfect croaking. Well, you won't be able to hide the tank or anything because you know you can only do this with small materials. And plus, you could only do it at one frequency, so it's not that interesting. But you can do other things like bending light over radii that are much smaller than diffraction would permit you to do. You could squeeze the light from a macroscopic scale to a nano scale over very short distances, manipulating light on a nano scale in a way that's not permitted by classical uh, optics, like tunneling, if you want, with infinite decay light. But how are we going to do that, right? Epsilon and mu not only determine n, but they also determine the reflectivity, which is z, the impedance, minus 1 divided by z plus 1. And z is defined as the square root of mu over epsilon. Now, typically, you probably did not see this in this form because typically textbooks assume that mu is 1. So they, they, they put already mu as 1 in there, but I wanted the more general case. So let's imagine that we have epsilon go to 0. Well, then n goes to 0, but z goes to infinity. If z goes to infinity, what is the reflectivity? Infinity divided by infinity is 1, and therefore the reflectivity becomes 1. That's bad. You have a 0 index material, but you can't get your light in. By the way, every day you see such a material. What is that? Every morning when you get up, you look at such a material. What would that material be? A mirror. A mirror, exactly. A mirror is metallic. You have a negative real epsilon. You have a positive real epsilon, which goes through zero at the plasma frequency. And therefore, you get this beautiful reflection where you can observe yourself. So great material, but no light in the material. Great zero index material, but you cannot get the light in. OK, so that doesn't work. Let's imagine having mu go to 0. Well, if mu goes to 0, then n goes to 0. z goes to 0, too. But if z goes to 0, then r becomes minus 1, which means you still have reflectivity of 1, but there's a phase shift of pi radian. No good either. The only way to get a 0 index material where you can couple light into the material would be to have both epsilon and mu go to 0 at the same time. So you can keep a finite C. So how do you do that? You need a magnetic response. Can't change the properties of the atoms. But that's where a metamaterial comes in. You can design a material with units that have an engineered response. So let's imagine an array of dielectric rods as shown there. <clears throat> and I imagine that I space the rods and roughly the frequency of the effective wavelengths in that media. Now look, look very carefully at one rod and notice that the electric field has a very different value on one side than it has on the other. Let's blow this up a little bit. The electric field produces an electric response, but if you look carefully, you can see that on one side, the electric field is pointing up and then the other side, on the left side, it's pointing down. So you get some positive charge on the front at the top and negative at the front and the bottom, negative at the front on the, on the back at the top and positive at the back at the bottom. It's like a quadrupole. It's like a little uh, curled loop. Well, by the right hand rule, there's an associated magnetic field that would point out. So the electric response, if you want, produces an electric response because of the fact that this dielectric rod has a, a size that is comparable to the effective wavelengths in the medium. So the whole crux of the matter, if you want, is to adjust the parameters so that both the magnetic resonance and the electric resonance are at the same point. So what are the adjustable parameters? Well, we can change the diameter of the rods. We can change the spacing of the rods. We cannot really change the index of refraction because we pretty much have to use a material like silicon in order to do this. But we can change the index of refraction in between the rods by putting a, a polymer there. 
and a lot of work, which I'm not showing to you, we're able to come up with these initial parameters uh, to uh, show that we could get a zero index. So here it shows the real part of the dielectric constant, real part of the susceptibility, and you can see that right around 1575 or so, they cross zero. In fact, if you plot N, you can see that there's a linear dispersion down, and the impedance, which is the cash line there, is finite. It's not, you know, zero or infinite. So how do we make that material? I'm going to wrap up here by showing you some data, and then unfortunately I will have to disappear. Um, so we, we first start by making pillars of silicon in our, uh, in our clean room. Uh, you can see the scale, they're, they're less than 500 nanometers in diameter. But in order to, we cannot make very tall rods, we can only make short rods. In order to make these short rods appear like infinite rods, we then first evaporate gold at the bottom in between the rods to have a mirror at the bottom. There's also a little bit of gold that comes on the top, as you can see. Then we spin coat a polymer in between the rods to change that index of refraction from 1 to 1.45, and finally put a a top gold mirror. So now we have short pillars. There's a gold mirror at the bottom and a gold mirror at the top. And in between the pillars, we have uh, we have we have this polymer solution. So what do the two mirrors do? If you have two parallel mirrors and you stand in between, you see an infinite number of copies of, of yourself. So the infinite copies of the small pillar sort of, if you want, uh, mimics the behavior of a large long pillar. And how are we going to show that we have zero index? Well, how did Newton discuss index by using a prism? So let's make a prism of the zero material, index material. If the prism is in the middle, you send in a wave. And if it's a zero index material, there should be no refraction. So we built this prism of these pillars, of this pillar material. We come in with a silicon waveguide bringing in light. And then we look at this refraction angle alpha. And if alpha is zero, we know that it's zero index material. So how do we measure that angle zero? Well, we add a semicircular slab of polymer. And then we look at the scattering of the light at the edge of that polymer, uh, polymer slab. So here's the actual device. So this was a, a sketch that I made, and this is an electron microscope picture. You can see the little mirror there at the top. There it is. You can't see the pillars because, sorry, the little prism at the top. You can't see the pillars because they're covered by this mirror. And um, here's the actual device. You can see the prism there. You can see the silicon waveguide, and then you can see this polymer slab waveguide, SU8 is a type of polymer um, that we use to measure the refraction. And then we have a calibration waveguide around it. That calibration waveguide has a scatterer here, a scatterer there, and a scatterer there, so that when we look at the microscope, we know what is zero degrees and 90 degrees. And then if you look very carefully, you can see a little replica, replica of this prism right here. It's hard to see from where you are, but you can actually see the individual pillars. We do not put the mirrors, we do not put the polymers. This way we can measure the spacing and we can measure the diameter of the uh, pillars as fabricated. We make many of these different devices varying the different parameters. And then we carry out the measurement by measuring alpha as a function of wavelengths. Here's a picture. You can see where the semicircular slab is, where the waveguide is. You can see a little bit of scattering at the prism, but you can also see scattering at the bottom there. In fact, you can see, see zero angle scattering at a wavelength of 15, 70 nanometers. So now we're gonna take that little slab there, that little slice, if you want, we're gonna bend it straight and we're gonna make a, a plot. We're gonna show the angle on the vertical versus the wavelengths on the horizontal. If we make the angle smaller, we get positive index. If we make the angle longer, we get negative index, exactly as predicted. In fact, the simulations show this behavior. And I think there's a pretty good agreement between the experiment 
and, and uh, the simulation. And if we now, that was alpha, right? That was the refractive angle, not the index. Well, we can determine the index by using Snell's law and just put in the index of refraction of the polymer and then divide sine alpha by sine 45 degrees, which is the incident angle due to the geometry of the prism. So we can calculate what n is. And if we calculate n from that previous plot, this is what you get. And you can see an unambiguous crossing of n through zero. So this is the first demonstration of a real zero index material that has this infinite phase velocity, but of course, no infinite signal uh, propagation. Um, I wish I had time to show you more because there is so much more and it's, it's so beautiful because it, it, it really involves simple principles in physics, but that are deep principles of, uh, of physics. But unfortunately, I am out of time. I, I, uh, I had many other slides that I wanted to show you, but if you're interested, you can download my slides and look at them. And uh, I hope one day to meet you at a conference or have an opportunity to talk more to you. So I wish you luck with your studies. Thank you so much for listening. I hope that uh, you found this uh, interesting.